Well, let me just offer a very warm welcome to the Warburg Institute's virtual lecture room. Uh, and uh, amazingly, to the second season of Stargates, I think we, we need a theme song and uh, all kinds of uh, other trappings now because this has become a real fixture. Um, of course, one of the best developments, I'm Bill Sherman, I should say, director of the Warburg Institute, and, and for me, one of the best developments in an otherwise very challenging year last year was the development uh, of online events, which brought together uh, communities who couldn't uh, normally meet or otherwise meet, uh, certainly not with the same kind of frequency. And um, a number of series at the Warburg Institute uh, last year really seemed to take on a life of their own, more than I think than we expected. Um, and there were two or three that were so great that we decided we had to continue with them this year. Um, and Stargates was one of them. It was um, uh, an extremely um, interesting series of talks, but also a kind of growing community of inquiry. And so I think um, it's safe to say that uh, Stargates too uh, we'll continue the tradition now and um, and continue to open up new insights. And part of the reason why it uh, produced so much momentum last year uh, and so many uh, great seminars was the, the quality of the speakers. It was uh, really lucky to attract uh, the experts on so many subjects. And so for that reason, I'm especially happy that this year's series begins with Dr. Hanegraaff one of the presiding deities uh, in the field uh, or fields that this series touches on. Um, really delighted to have Wouter here, um, a, a friend of the Warburg and uh, to many uh, people who work and study here. So Wouter, welcome to you uh, in particular. But I also have to say welcome back to Luisa Capodieci because Louise, it was Luisa's idea to run this series and it was very much her network and her energy that kept it uh, going last year. And so Louisa ha had the very strange experience of being a long term fellow at the Warburg Institute and never being at the Institute. So I think I'm right in saying you never came to the Institute during your entire fellowship, which was tragic on some level. But of course, you're always with us. And now here you are again. And so I'm very, very happy to welcome Louisa uh, back, courtesy of Zoom, uh, into the Warburg Institute. Uh, and again, grateful to her for uh, taking the initiative to run this fantastic seminar. So uh, Louisa, without further ado, I will hand over to you to introduce the evening and um, just thank you again and say how nice it is to see you uh, back at the Warburg. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, I hope I can come uh, after my fellowship. <laughs> Maybe I think I will be in London after Any, the fellowship. Anytime. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are waiting to Don Trash, we, who is co-organizing this series with me. And uh, it's a great honor. It's a great honor for me to introduce Walter Hanegraaff, who really needs no introduction, I think. Uh, he is professor of history of hermetic philosophy and related currents at the University of Amsterdam. And he is head of the history of hermetic philosophy research group in the same university. His numerous studies are fundamental in the field of research from late antiquity to the present day. And he is the author of a famous book on New Age, New Age Religion and Western Culture, Esotericism in the Mirror of Secular <laughs> Thought. And uh, I would like to recall the first one I read when I was finishing my PhD, Ludovico Lazzarelli, oh. The Hermetic Writing and Related Documents, a book he wrote with Rod Bottom. And since then, Professor Hanne Graf has published many more books you can find on his web page and his blog. I'll mention only the last two. Esotericism in the academy, rejected knowledge in Western culture, 
and uh, Western esotericism a guide for the perplexed. And he's currently pursuing two very exciting project, a revisionist history of hermetic philosophy and the reception of mesmerism in German romanticism. And uh, before giving the floor to Professor Anne Graf, I would like to mention his upcoming book, Hermetic Spirituality and Historical Imagination, Altered States of Knowledge in Late Antiquity. And the theme of his lecture tonight, Terrestrial Gods and Statues of Light, is related to this book for coming in spring 2022. And I am truly honored to give you the floor, Walter. And thank you to the Warburg, and thank you, Bill. Thank you very much, Louisa, for this very kind, very generous uh, uh, introduction. It's, uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's great to be here at the Warburg, even though it's not physical. But I have been there a couple of times, and I hope to come back if it's possible. And um, no, it's great to be here. Thank you very much, and I really look forward to this. Um, I think it's um, best if I share my screen and let me see whether everything works right. So here we go. I hope everything is clear. Yeah, you can see it well. Okay. <clears throat> yes, okay. Well, I'll just launch into my lecture, which is based upon the book that uh, Louisa just uh, mentioned, which is coming out next year. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to say is that uh, in this lecture, I'm not going to talk about amulets and talismans. I understand that the series is mostly about those topics, uh, but that's not my topic. Um, I will be talking about one of the most important and most uh, well-known standard references that uh, keep coming back uh, when you look at medieval and early modern debates about these topics like, Alice, uh, <coughs> like amulets and talismans. And this is, of course, um, the famous passage or rather several passages in the Hermetic Asclepius about the animation of statues and images, uh, which have been referenced again and again by later authors, um, you know, in the Renaissance and the Middle, and the, and the, and the Middle Ages. Um, <clears throat> simply because they have been seen as a uh, model example of what talismanic uh, practice was all about. So the lecture is not about uh, the later reception, it is about uh, the original practices that, um, that you find in the Hermetic literature, especially in the Hermetic Asclepius. <clears throat> um, and I would like to begin with a bit of historical context, first of all, and then my PowerPoint should change. I hope it will work. There we go. I would like to like to begin with a bit of historical context. Um, on March 19, uh, 235 of the Common Era, as you can see here, the young Roman Emperor Severus Alexander was assassinated together with his mother at the order of a general who had assumed control over the army. And this was the beginning of what historians have often called the crisis of the third century. A 50 year period of anarchy, civil war, that brought the Roman empire close to total collapse. <clears throat> no less than 24 emperors came and went. Most of them met a violent death. Some committed suicide. Many were killed by the Praetorian guards. Others died on the battlefield. <clears throat> a few of those emperors succumbed to the plague for in the midst of this period of crisis, the empire was struck by a frightening pandemic. Pandemic, It killed so many people on both sides of the Mediterranean. At one point, the death toll in Rome seems to have been 5,000 each day, that the Bishop of Carthago, uh, Cyprian, believed that the end of the world had arrived. And as if all that was not enough, uh, Egypt was invaded in 270 of the Common Era by the armies from Palmyra under the Syrian queen Septimia Zenobia. Uh, she brought the eastern part of the empire under her control for a few years, including Egypt, but uh, was eventually defeated by the Emperor Aurelian. As Roman military control was weakening because of all of these troubles, Upper Egypt, which is of course in the south of Egypt, uh, suffered invasions by desert tribes from Libya and Nubia. And in the midst of all this violent turmoil and chaos, 
more and more Egyptians were leaving their ancient religion behind and converted to Christianity, that strange new religion which seemed to be taking the world by storm. <clears throat> now, at some time during this period of crisis, somewhere in Egypt, we do not know exactly where, an anonymous devotee of the legendary wisdom teacher Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest Hermes, composed a text in Greek about the way of true wisdom, known as the Logos Teleios, usually translated as perfect discourse. It is the longest and the most explicitly Egyptian text among all the spiritual hermetica that have come down to us. Except for a few fragments, this Greek original itself is lost, but we have a Latin translation or adaptation or paraphrase known as the Asclepius, and, and important parts of the text have also survived in a Coptic translation discovered at Nag Hammadi in 1945. So that is the textual materials that we are talking about. Uh, the dialogue is situated in the inner sanctuary of an Egyptian temple. And it gives us a divinely inspired speech by Hermes Trismegistus, directed at his pupils Asclepius, Tut, and Amon. The atmosphere of pious serenity might at first seem, at first sight, seem like a contrast with the social and political realities outside the temple, suggestive perhaps of an inward turn towards spiritual experience as a way of ignoring or trying to escape from the evils of the world. But we will see, and this is important to my story, that those evils are actually very present. Like a, you might think of it like a rumbling noise in the distance that keeps coming closer as we get through the dialogue. In the older scholarly literature, the Logos de Leos has often been described as an optimistic treatise. But I would say that something is wrong with that assessment. Hermes in this text is telling his pupils that all true spiritual wisdom is in decline on earth. Just a few people are still keeping it alive, but very soon there will be literally none of them left. The gods are abandoning Egypt and ruthless criminals are taking their place. In short, the future of humanity looks very dark indeed. And it is in this context that we have to imagine this famous text. The Asclepius is not just a theoretical exposition of how everything in the world is hanging together. It is that too, but it is more. It is interesting to note that Hermes' um, instruction of Asclepius and the other pupils is marked by evident pedagogical concerns and by a very strong sense of moral urgency. Whenever he needs to discuss a particularly difficult and sublime topic, he calls for divine assistance and inspiration so that he may find the right words and that his pupils may be able to understand them. Even so, he goes out of his way to instruct his audience at crucial spots to concentrate, to pay close attention. <clears throat> uh, because, as he says, the true meaning of what he is about to tell them is so subtle that it can hardly be put into words at all. And I will give you a, one particularly clear example of these typical exhortations to special attention. Here's the quotation. Now be completely present. Give me your whole attention with all the understanding that you are capable of, with all the subtlety you can muster. For the teaching about divinity requires a divine noetic concentration if it is to be understood. It is just like a torrential river plunging headlong down from the heights so violently that with its rapidity and speed, it outstrips the attention not only of whoever is listening, but also of whoever is speaking. If you pay attention, you will see what I mean. For what I'm saying is sublime and divine beyond the power of human minds and purposes, unless you hear and receive with full attention the words that are spoken to you. Otherwise, they will just fly or flow past you, or rather they will flow back in themselves and return to the waters of their own source. I'm quoting here a translation, by the way, of Peter Kingsley, who has been connected to the Warburg Institute as well in an earlier phase. <clears throat> Scholars of the Hermetica have not always taken these passages as seriously as I believe they should. In fact, whenever we encounter such passages, the author is trying to make us aware that he is about to say something particularly important and so we should better pay attention to. A particularly difficult moment of that kind, a moment of potential misunderstanding 
and even conflict occurs when Hermes remarks that humans imitate the supreme creator by making terrestrial gods. So there we have them, the terrestrial gods. When Hermes says that, Asclepius' face apparently betrays incredulity or even stupefaction about that statement. For Hermes interrupts his discourse to address him directly. Does that cause you to wonder or do you too have doubts like so many, he says. Asclepius readily admits to being confused and at a loss about what to say, but he declares himself willing to be convinced. But clearly, his puzzlement remains apparently visible on his face, for a similar prickly moment occurs not much further on, when an evidently still incredulous Asclepius blurts out, you aren't talking about statues, are you? Hermes responds to this with evident irritation. It is you, it is you who are talking about statues. Look at your incredulity. You are talking about beings endowed with nous and spirits, pneuma, you call them statues. Now, what is going on here? These messages were written at a time when, of course, when communities of Jews could be found throughout the Roman Empire, although, and that's notable, precisely not in Egypt between 117 and the later third century due to an huge massacre that had taken place that doesn't have to concern us here. But at the same time, of course, Christians were increasing in their numbers with astounding uh, 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 rapidity. As everybody knows, of course, at the very heart of their religious identity of both Jews and Christians was a radical rejection of religious image worship, worship denounced by both traditions as the ultimate sin of idolatry. Now, I strongly agree with Jan Asman, supported in this regard by other scholars, such as Masha Halbertal and Avishai Margalitz, whom you all see all three here at the bottom. I agree with them that what really defined the radical or exclusive monotheism of Jews and Christians was not just their belief in one God, but rather their absolute horror of worshiping graven images, Exodus 20, 4 to 5. This was the sin par excellence, the point on which no compromise could ever be possible. As formulated by Halbertal and Margalitz, it was the thick wall that separated the pagan, the non-pagans from pagans. For Egyptians who adhered to traditional modes of worship, these polemics and attacks must have been profoundly puzzling and disconcerting. After all, their entire religion was grounded in a daily practice of reverent care for the gods that were living in the temple statues. What could possibly be wrong with such acts of piety and devotion? They must have been asking themselves. Nevertheless, it would seem that younger generations of Egyptians were beginning to entertain a somewhat different perspective. Influenced by mounting critiques of image worship, as well as philosophical doubts about the uh, spiritual efficacy of material artifacts, they may no longer have been so sure about the value of those ancient rituals kept alive by elderly priests in the decaying temples of Roman Egypt, because the Romans uh, had very little respect for um, Egyptian religion and the temples and the priesthood were in decline. Now, I would suggest that precisely this tension, uh, generational tension perhaps, is reflected in the Asclepius discussion. Hermes is speaking like an initiated temple priest, familiar with the daily practice of ritual animation, whereas his pupil Asclepius sounds like an outsider. The traditional Egyptian practice of making images of the gods is under threat because of the people's ignorance. Such is clearly Hermes' point of view. But when he refers to it in tones of praise, he notices to his dismay that even his own pupil responds with doubt and incredulity, like so many, as he bitterly remarks. That Asclepius does not understand the true nature of the gods is confirmed later on, when he refers to them as mere statues, using specific Latin and Coptic words that suggest that they are really just matter. On the contrary, Hermes exclaims, they are living beings endowed with the ultimate spiritual light, referred to as nous, and with spirits, pneuma. They deliver oracles and accomplish great wonders, for they are in fact gods not statues. Now, a very important point is being made here 
uh, but it is somewhat subtle and I think it has often been overlooked. And so perhaps Asclepius could be excused for missing it too. The key, in my opinion, um, lies in the embodied condition of human beings, not just the embodied condition of statues, but of human beings, the makers of those gods. Elsewhere in the Asclepius, human beings are referred to as a great miracle, precisely because of their unique middle status in the universe. The same point is made in the first treatise of the Corpus Hermeticum, the Poimandries, which emphasizes that every single man or woman is a, as they, as they call it, a lucky mixture of both spiritual essence and terrestrial matter. As I've argued at great length in my forthcoming book, Hermes sees this human condition of embodiment not as a regrettable fall into materiality, the famous fall of man, according to biblical models. No, he sees it as a supreme divine gift. Embodiment is something miraculous and wonderful. Hermes makes a point of emphasizing that precisely the participation of human beings in mortal existence is what makes them more even than divine. They are superior even to the immortal planetary gods. Since the planetary gods are made of nothing but celestial fire, they are incapable of experiencing the full range of existence, whereas human beings have the ability to enjoy the best of both worlds, the noetic or spiritual world out there and the material world down here. This makes them quite literally into terrestrial gods themselves. Human beings are incarnated or embodied deities whose true vocation is to care for the world through their bodies while their spiritual part stays in communion with the divine source. Now, it is because they participate simultaneously in the world of matter and in the generative noetic power of divinity that human beings have the unique ability to also imitate their creator by making or it is making a life or giving birth to gods in their own image. Those gods are therefore really and quite literally, quote, living beings endowed with nous and spirit, just like themselves. And this helps us understand why Hermes is so irritated with Asclepius. To speak of the temple gods as mere statues is to miss the whole point. It is about as careless and as ignorant as if Asclepius had described human beings as lifeless corpses. What we also see here is the true depth of the abyss between hermetic spirituality and exclusive monotheism. That the veneration of images could be construed as an attempt to direct human worship away from God and towards the work of one's own hands, that's a thought that never seems to occur to Hermes. One imagines that it would have struck, them, struck him as contrived and perverse, as a malicious distortion based on regrettable ignorance. To him, it is obvious that the one divine source of, of all that is, the benevolent dispenser of universal light and life, need not fear competition from any other god. He is far above such petty feelings as jealousy or anger. The Hermetica are explicit in marking envy as one of the chief vices. And so he, God cannot be hurt or offended by our actions in any way. The divine source, the Pege in Greek, the source just generally dispenses life and light to all human beings, no matter what happens, without the slightest reservation. Therefore, if human beings turn away from those blessings, they are not offending God. They are only hurting themselves by neglecting the very source of universal energy that sustains their own existence. As for the human activity of making gods and, carry, and caring for them in the temples, this directly mirrors the divine activity of making humans and caring for them in the temple of the whole world. As such, it gives symbolic and ritual expression to the great work of embodying the spiritual on earth while at the same time spiritualizing terrestrial bodies. So embodiment is a theme that I keep coming back to here and in my book as a whole. Now, th that the gods were alive in their temples, delivering oracles and accomplishing great wonders, such as sending dreams or healing illnesses, was, of course, a perfectly common belief in ancient Egypt. It survived well into the Roman periods when reference began to be made to mysterious ritual practices 
known as the telestic art. The telestic art concerned with animating statues so as to make them come alive. In a well-known passage, the philosopher Plotinus, an Egyptian by birth, who received his education in Alexandria, referred to such practices in positive terms. And the quotation is well known, but I'll give it here. Plotinus writes, and it seems to me that the ancient wise man who made temples and statues so that the gods might be present in them showed insight in the nature of the all. They perceived that since the soul is everywhere easy to attract, it would be secured most easily by constructing some appropriate receptacle capable of receiving some portion of it, something reproducing it or representing it and serving like a mirror, a mirror to catch an image of it. In a fragmentary treatise of the Corpus Hermeticum, Corpus Hermeticum 17, we find the same idea of statues as mirrors, mirrors in which incorporeal entities can be reflected and caught and whose images are reflected back to the incorporeal world in turn. Reflections in mirrors are transmitted, of course, by light. And in fact, the animation of statues is described explicitly as a practice of illumination. Statues get illuminated. The exact statements by Hermes to which Asclepius responded with so much incomprehension can be translated most plausibly, I think, as follows. And I quote, just as the Lord and Father or God, as his highest name, is the maker of the celestial gods, likewise man is the maker of the gods that are content to live close to human beings in the temples. And not only is he illuminated, or are they illuminated, but he illuminates or they illuminate in turn. Not only does man advance towards gods, but he also makes gods. There are two possible translations here. Uh, this has, uh, has to do with uh, variations in the manuscripts. So you have a choice and we do not know what was meant. This language of illumination was current in discussions of the telestic art. For instance, Proclus writes that by means of symbols and ineffable centamata, signatures, it, represent, it represents and makes statues suitable for becoming receptacles for the illumination of the gods. And the empowerment or animation of images could be described as sparking or kindling into flame. But the most important key passages are found in Iamblichus. In my forthcoming book, I discuss him together with the alchemist Zosimos as a hermetic practitioner who must have had first-hand knowledge of the spiritual practices and ceremonies of Egyptian priests. Contrary to traditional understandings, it is evident, I, I think, from Eunapius' biography of Yamlichus, that the philosopher from Syria actually spent a considerable period of his life in Egypt, where he had long conversations with another philosopher named Alipius. And because Alipius seems to have been of very tiny stature, I have taken the liberty here to make a playful picture quotation, I hope you don't mind, from the TV series Game of Thrones. So as you can see, Lord Varys appears here as Jamblichus and Tyrion Lannister of the series uh, appears as Alipius. Now, of course, if you are interested in my exact argument about Jamblichus in Egypt, because I know it is controversial, I can explain the arguments in the Q&A, if you will. Anyway. Such is the power of the superior divine entities, Iamblichus explains, that nothing can prevent them from being present in all things, very much like the rays of the sun. In a similar manner, the transcendent universal light of the gods illuminates the totality of existence while nevertheless remaining fixed in itself. And here's the quotation. Therefore, they, the gods, illuminate even the lowest levels, and the immaterial beings are immaterially present in the material. So nobody should be surprised if we say that there is such a thing as a pure and divine matter, which possesses a perfection that makes it suitable to receive the gods. Observing this and discovering in a general manner the various receptacles convenient to each of the gods according to their specific characters, the theurgic art often combines stones, plants, animals, aromatic substances, and other such sacred things that are perfect and similar to the gods, so as to compose from all of them 
a perfect and pure receptacle. Now this passage provides us with a close parallel to Hermes's second longer and most controversial statement about the animation of statues. Having briefly discussed how ideal incorporeal realities are reflected in their bodily manifestations, towards the end of his discourse, he again connects the double nature of human beings with their ability to make gods. And this is the most famous of the so-called God-making passages. It is indeed of great importance, not only for its intrinsic interest and for the light it shows on hermetic practice, but also because this explicit defense of idolatry would come to be condemned by Augustine in book eight of De Civitate Dei. And that condemnation would very much determine the fate of hermetic spirituality as a whole after the rise of Christianity. So I'll, yeah, this is a very important passage. Uh, some of you may know it very well, but I'll give you a large part of the passage here in my translation. There we go. More admirable than all other wonders is the fact that man has been able to discover the divine nature and make it manifest. As our ancestors were very much confused as to what the gods were all about, for they were unbelieving and inattentive to worship and divine reverence, they invented a procedure for manifesting the gods. They empowered their invention by adding a virtue drawn from the nature of the world, thus bringing both natures together and mixing them. As they could not make souls, they evoked the souls of diamonds or angels, drawing them into these images through sacred and divine mystery rites, so that these idols could have the power to produce good and evil. The terrestrial and material gods are easily angered because human beings have made and composed them of both natures. Asclepius asks, oh, what is the quality of those gods that are called terrestrial, Trismegistus? And the answer is, it consists of herbs, stones, and aromatic plants that contain a natural divine power. They are entertained by frequent sacrifices, hymns, praises, and lovely sounds in a mode that reflects the divine harmony, so that the part in them that is celestial, which through constant celestial practice was drawn into the statues, may be content to endure the presence of humanity and remain there for a long period of time. This is how man fashions the gods. The gods down here all have their own specific assignments and are helping us out in a spirit of friendly communion, whether by giving specific prophecies for lots and divination, by foreseeing specific things or assisting us appropriately in our human affairs. Now, exactly as in Jamblich's theology, the natural virtue or power that allows statues to be illuminated by the gods resides in a mixture of herbs, stones, and aromatic plants. This is what Jamblich's, for his part, referred to as the perfect and pure receptacle of the gods, so perfect that it could receive and transmit the light of divinity. There's general agreement among specialists that such materials were supposed to work through the universal power of sympathy. And I'm sure that this is extremely well known to the audience uh, here today, uh, the power of sympathy. In theoretical context, herbs, stones, and aromatic plants were referred to as material centenata or signatures. They should be seen as being part of great chains, serai, of creatures and objects ranging from the highest to the lowest levels of the universe that, the, that were all intimately connected, not through links of instrumental causality, but because they participated in a common ontological essence that they all reflected and could make present each on their own appropriate level. This theory gave philosophical justification to the view that specific organic or inorganic substances could contain a higher divine virtue and render it present in a specific location, such as a statue in a sanctuary, but also, of course, by implication, a talisman. Now, I find it important to always remember that we are not just dealing with theories here, but primarily with practice. How do we explain that priests and philosophers in Egypt during the Roman period were convinced that they had actually witnessed temple statues become alive and lighten up with the power of the gods? How to explain that? 
Well, first of all, in our attempts to understand the animation of images, we are, I think, mentally handicapped by what has been described in the literature as the museum effect. Our culture predisposes us to see God statues as inanimate art objects, displayed in artificial environments far removed from their original settings. Standing on pedestals by themselves, unadorned, carefully spotlighted by track lights against a subdued background. But that is not, of course, how they would appear in their original cultic setting. Because I obviously don't have a photograph from ancient Egypt, I here show you an equivalent from contemporary Indian practice, just to give you the idea. Priests and devotees would typically interact with statues in a much more physical and personal, even intimate manner, touching, anointing, bathing, dressing, adorning, or feeding the statues while speaking to them and entertaining them with songs and instrumental music. That's one aspect. Secondly, one, uh, secondly, any cathedral visitor today knows that even such a familiar statue as the Virgin Mary in a side chapel, placed in a devotional setting of silence and respect, enhanced by incense and candles, can sometimes dominate its, its immediate environment in such a powerful and natural manner that even determined unbelievers may find it hard to avoid this eerie sense of some kind of presence over there on the altar. In a separate publication, I have argued that we are dealing there in such cases with a pre-rational phenomenon of what I call primary response that makes it easy for human beings to invest God images with a mysterious power of life and agency, particularly in ritual settings that impinge directly on the senses of sight, hearing, and smell simultaneously. Furthermore, we should not underestimate the remarkable skills of Egyptian statue manufacturers. One of them was Zosimos of Panopolis, the famous founding figure of alchemy, who made his living as a maker of temple statues. He was evidently very proud of the fact that his statues were so lifelike that they frightened the temple visitors who did not even dare to look at them straight. At one point, he breaks out in praise of his own skills. He gives his pupil, Theosibaya, expert advice about how to create the illusion of animation. For instance, how to give a statue the brilliant texture of a woman's skin. How moving it is to admire the invention of these arts, he writes. How beautiful is the sight. So these statues must have been pretty impressive. Still, all of that does not seem to give us the whole picture, for we are told that sometimes the gods made spectacular appearances right in front of the theorist. Such theophanies could be awe-inspiring, as explained by a very important scholar on these fields, Sarah Isles Johnston. I give a quotation by her. The Yamlichus tells us that when the gods appear directly, they shine with a formless brilliance greater than any earthly light, that moves more rapidly than the human intellect, although the God himself remains motionless. The brilliance of this light, moreover, can be tolerated only briefly by terrestrial eyes. And even when it enters the eyes, such light is actually seen only by the soul. Although a brief encounter with divinity in this form could help purify the soul of the theorist and enhance his long-term health, he was enfeebled and struggled to breathe while experiencing it. So what is going on here? The most reasonable explanation for such radical experiences as described here, leads us back, I think, again, to those herbs and aromatics that are mentioned both by Jamlichus and the Asclepius, both times explicitly in the context of statue animation. In an, impressive, uh, in an impressively thorough discussion, Friedrich Pfister pointed out a long time ago that occasionally, fumigations also serve to arouse religious hallucinations and ecstatic states of consciousness. The emphasis is in the original. And in more recent years, the classicist George Luck drew a logical, the logical conclusion. Most plausibly, he writes, incense was nominally offered to the deities, but effectively inhaled and experienced by the priests and some of the people. For instance, the medical authority Galen reports that enthusiasm, 
uh, is a state of ecstasy produced in some people from smoke in the sanctuaries when they see apparitions, listening to drums or flutes or cymbals. Most relevant in this regard is the famous Egyptian Kufi incense, which had narcotic properties. Plutarch wrote about Kufi that the imaginative faculty susceptible to dreams, it brightens like a mirror. Once again, please note the combination of mirrors and light. Moreover, Jamblichus also mentions not just fumigations inhaled by practitioners, but also unspecified substances that alongside ritual incantations and alongside rites of conjunction practiced in darkness, what is that? Substances that had to be swallowed or ingested in order to make the divine light manifest to the practitioners. All of that leads me to a quite straightforward conclusion. It has been rather common scholarly practice to suspect, to suspect the authors of these sources, either of serious irrationality and insane delusions. They must have kept imagining things that we know to be impossible. Or to suspect them of systematic deception. They must have made it all up. But I find it much more reasonable to assume that at least some of them, sometimes really did see statues lighten up and witnessed other awesome luminous phenomena. Not because they were deluded or crazy or were liars out, out to deceive us, but because they were under the influence of psychoactive agents that we know to be capable of creating such effects. Whether this dimension was also present in the ritual practice alluded to in the Asclepius specifically is impossible for us to establish. But I believe we can say with confidence that it was part of the complete scope of what statue illumination could mean in the context of the telestic art. But the relevance of statue animation to the Asclepius goes further than the famous God-making statues, and also has bearing on the other passage that has made this text famous. This is the impressive hermetic lament, the lament about the future decline of Egypt maybe the most often quoted uh, uh, passage from the entire hermetic literature. To see this further dimension I want to call your attention to, we must pay attention to the concrete realities of temple architecture and make an effort to empathize with the gods in the way that hermetic practitioners would have been likely to empathize with the gods as they imagined their material living conditions. What do I mean by that? I'll try to explain. Our hermetic treatises make the point that having to dwell in material bodies was quite an ordeal for the gods. We already saw that earlier in one of the passages. It was an ordeal. The impurity of their surroundings was bound to make the gods irritable and quick to anger. In order for the gods to endure such uncomfortable living conditions, to stay where they were and to remain willing to assist humanity in caring for the world, they had to be entertained. To the, had to be kept happy by frequent sacrifices, hymns, praises, and lovely sounds reminiscent of their celestial origin. That is what we read in Asclepius 37 to 38. The implication is perfectly clear. If those sacred practices will ever be neglected or abandoned, then the gods will surely leave their statues and return to where they came from, leaving nothing behind but empty shells. From a traditional Egyptian perspective, as represented here by Hermes Trismegistus, such an event would be not just regrettable, but simply catastrophic. To really understand why this is so, we need to make an effort of the imagination. What were the gods really all about? What was their essential function? They were living deep inside the darkest interior of their temples enclosed in very small spaces and protected from outside contamination by many protective layers. As pointed out by Jan Asman at the example of the Temple of Horus at Edfu, and I quote, from the exterior to the interior, the rooms become ever smaller, while the floors, floor becomes higher and the ceiling lower. Corresponding to the diminishing of space is an increasing darkness. The courtyard, which is flooded with light, is followed by the crepuscular hall of appearance. The inner rooms lie in deep darkness. This meant that the, inv the invisible divine light, which animated the statue, 
contain the temple's inner darkness, while the visible physical daylight would be relatively empty of such divine presence. So light and darkness, so to speak, are there it, it's our counterpart, you might almost say. Now, with this architecture in mind, Asman at one point compares the gods to the pulsating energy at the core of modern nuclear reactors. Their enormous and potentially deadly power had to be carefully contained and managed by trained professionals, the priests, so that it could be safely channeled and distributed towards the outside world. Without this beneficial life-giving energy at its very core, the social organism would fall apart. Now, according to the anonymous author of the Logos de Leos, the Asclepius, that is precisely what he sees happening in his own time. Through the persona of Hermes Trismegistus, I believe we actually find ourselves listening to the voice of a third century Egyptian who knows that the culture that he cares for is dying. With deep sorrow and resignation, he tells his pupils that they are the last generation to be in touch with the truth. After us, no one will have that simple love, the love of wisdom, that consists only in knowing the divinity through frequent contemplation and sacred reverence. The people who will come after us will be deceived by cunning sophistry and estranged from the true, pure and sacred love of wisdom. Very soon, he says, there will be literally nobody left on earth who still knows how the gods are to be venerated and cared for. When that moment comes, what will happen? It makes perfect sense that immediately after introducing the animation of temple images to an still incredulous Asclepius, Hermes continues by describing the terrible consequences that follow when the daily practice of veneration and divine worship is neglected or even abandoned altogether. And this is perhaps, as I said, the most famous passage from the entire Hermetic literature. It has been referred to as an apocalypse and a prophecy, but neither of those labels I think is entirely right. Technically, we are reading a prediction of events that still lie in the future. But in fact, it seems clear to me that the author speaks in fact from personal experience. What we are reading may be described as the vivid, almost visionary nightmare of an hermetic devotee during the crisis of the third century who is watching helplessly how his spiritual world is falling apart. And the quotation is long, but again, it's so famous, I, I cannot help myself, I will have to read a part of it to you. So, all that is divine will depart from Egypt and return to heaven, and Egypt will be a widow, abandoned by the gods. Foreigners will enter Egypt and rule it. Egypt and the Egyptians, most of all, will be prohibited from worshipping gods. And more than that, whoever will be found honoring and serving God will be severely punished, uh, will be severely punished. In those days, this land that is reverent beyond all other lands will become irreverent. It will no longer be filled with temples, but with tombs, and no longer with gods, but with corpses. Oh, Egypt, Egypt, your divinities will be like fables, and so will be your divine modes of worship. Barbarians will surpass you in reverence, oh, Egyptian, whether they are skiffs, Indians, or others of that kind. And you, O river, a day will come when you will be filled with blood more than with water. Corpses will be piled up higher than the banks, and the dead will be mourned more, less than the living. Egypt, the lover of the gods, the home of the gods, the school of divinity, will become the picture of irreverence. That day the universe will no longer be admired, but it will risk becoming a burden to all people. So they will hold it in contempt, this magnificent world made by God, this incomparable work. Shadows will be preferred over light. Death will be preferred over life. Nobody will raise his gaze to heaven. The reverent man will be considered crazy. The irreverent man will be honored like a sage. The coward will be considered strong and the good man will be punished like a criminal. As for the soul and all that is related to it, all that will be held laughable and ridiculous. Believe me, to be devoted to the religion of Nus will even constitute a capital crime. A new legal system will be created with new laws. And they will leave the benevolent gods. But the wicked angels will remain with human beings to induce them 
miserable wretches, to all kinds of evil excess, wars, looting, deceit, and all that is contrary to the nature of souls. Then neither will the earth be stable, nor will the sea be sealed, nor will heaven and the movements of the stars keep their balance. Every divine voice will be forced to fall silent. The fruits of the earth will rot. The earth will no longer be fertile and the very air will hang heavy and lifeless torpor. Now it is not so hard, I think, to place this description in the context of real life in Egypt under the impact of the third century crisis. The country had, of course, been flooded by foreigners for centuries, ever since the conquest by Alexander and the emergence of a cosmopolitan Hellenistic culture radiating from Alexandria. Moreover, the final decades of the third century were marked by rampant violence and bloodshed, with Queen Zenobia's armies entering the country from the east and Upper Egypt suffering a series of invasions by nomadic tribes from Libya in the west and Nubia in the south. Meanwhile, the Roman authorities had always been treating Egyptian religion with contempt as mere magical superstition and introduced policies and restrictions that caused the priesthood to lose its prestige and social relevance. As the economy declined during the catastrophic third century, temples became dependent on the diminishing finances of local councils. And thus, while the, the empire descended into chaos, the infrastructure of Egyptian religion fell apart. Such developments were obviously traumatic for Egyptians who still try to hold on to their ancestral traditions. As for the new laws and prohibitions that are mentioned here twice in the Asclepius fragment, they most probably have to do with an imperial decree issued in 199 by the Roman prefect of Egypt, Quintus Emilius Saturninus. It imposed capital punishment on anybody found guilty of practicing divination, consulting oracles, engaging in public processes of cult images, or claiming higher knowledge based on, quote, written documents supposedly granted in the presence of a deity. Well, that sounds very much like what we read actually in the Asclepius, doesn't it? Now, this decree was publicly displayed in every Egyptian city or village and must have been deeply intimidating to practitioners of traditional Egyptian religion, temple priests in particular. It is true that this attempt to put an end to Egyptian superstition seems not to have been very successful. But whatever its effectiveness, such an imperial decree meant that from the beginning of the third century onwards, not just ritual worship of temple images, but even divinely inspired discourses such as we find in the Asclepius were officially illegal and punishable by death. Therefore, it is no wonder that the author of the Logos de Laos believed that the end was near. Under such terrible conditions, Egypt could no longer fulfill its sacred mission of caring for the gods in their temples. And as a result, the gods were abandoning humanity. Seeing that foreign invaders were plunging Egypt into chaos and ruthless criminals could pollute the Nile with the blood of their victims, he must have drawn a perfectly logical conclusion. The dramatic end of Egyptian religion that had long been predicted in visionary prophecies was happening right here and right now. And in fact, he was not wrong. What had begun under the Romans was about to be finished by the Christians. Uh, with Augustine's condemnation of Hermes, in De Civitate Dei as the most explicit testimony. As the country that once thought of itself as the temple of the whole world was turned into a desolate graveyard filled with tombs and corpses, hermetic practitioners must have believed that the world was entering an age of utter darkness. As the gods had left the world, human beings now found themselves deprived of any spiritual protection and exposed helplessly to the malice of demons or wicked angels bent on poisoning their souls through the passions of the body. Very much like what you say here, see here on this uh, painting by, 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 by Jeroen Bosch. Well, the practice of hermetic spirituality was focused on ways for the soul to get liberated from those very conditions that we see here. But that is a different story for which we would need a different lecture. So I will stop at this rather gloomy final picture. And I want to thank you for your attention.